I think we can get started. So welcome everyone to our event, Black Power Meets Animal Rights, featuring the one and only Mike Africa Jr. Um, so this event is being co-hosted by Black Student Union and Cornell Vegan Society. And just to tell you a little bit about how this event is gonna go, we're gonna let Mike talk and share his story. And then after we're gonna have a Q&A session that's gonna be moderated by a BSU representative, Jalen. I'll let him introduce himself when the time comes. Um, also, just so you all know, this event is a part of Cornell Vegan Society's Intersectional Speaker Series. We're having this Intersectional Speaker Series that's gonna include several speakers throughout the semester. So make sure to stay updated with our social media. Next up, we're gonna have Lauren from the Food Empowerment Project. Um, so make sure you're keeping up with that. Um, so that being said, my name is Lucy Contreras. I'm one of the co-presidents of Cornell Vegan Society. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Mike Africa Jr. So to tell you a little bit about Mike, Mike Africa Jr. is the founder of the Mike Africa Jr. Information Company, a member of the MOVE organization and the Black Philly Radical Collective. He is a motivational resilient speaker who pushes his never give up message with his dynamic stage performances, mixing music in his orations. Mike is the son of two political prisoners who were sentenced to 100 years in prison. He was secretly born in a Philadelphia prison following a police raid on his family's home. As an infant, he was taken from his mother and placed in an orphanage where he was physically and mentally abused. At the age of six, he witnessed the smoke in the air from a police bomb that was dropped on his family's home, killing 11 of his family members, including five of the children that he was in an orphanage with. At the age of 13, Mike began using his music to raise awareness about his experiences in the hopes of gaining justice for his family. On June 16th, 2018, after 40 years in prison, Mike finally got his mother released. Four months later, on October 23rd, 2018, he was successful in gaining his father's release. Currently, Mike travels the country as a keynote speaker and a public speaker telling his incredible story and, his ins and inspiring others with his powerful message of never give up. Mike has shared the stage with the likes of Mark Lamont Hill, Tarana Burke, Ramona Africa, Dead Press, Danny Clover, Glover, and countless others, tackling issues such as mass incarceration, police brutality, and climate change. On December 3rd, the documentary 40 Years a Prisoner is going to premiere on HBO, chronicling his flight to free his parents. So that's a little bit about Mike. Um, everyone, please join me in giving him a warm welcome. And Mike, you can have the stage. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, I said, I said that uh, that bio, basically, you said everything that I was going to say. Um, so um, my story begins before I was born. Um, when hundreds of Philadelphia police officers came to Moose House, and they shot tear gas and they shot water cannons from high pressure deluge hoses. And they shot um, hundreds of rounds of ammunition um, into a house filled with men, women, children, and animals. Um, <clears throat> among the people in the house were my mother, my father, and seven other members of the MOVE organization. The members of the organization were taken to prison. And at the time, my mother was eight months pregnant with me. After a few weeks of being in the, in the cell, my mother, uh, who was a uh, naturalist practicing natural law, uh, understanding the connection between nature and herself, she gave birth to me in that jail cell without the help of any doctors, any nurses, any midwives. She gave birth to me in secret because she didn't want the same people who attacked our home and arrested us to be uh, to, to, to do anything to me. Um, so that's where my life begins. Um, after a couple of years 
of being on trial because when, when the people were arrested, they were arrested and they were charged with the murder of a Philadelphia police officer. You see, when they came to our, when the police came to our home and shot up the house and aimed those water cannons at us, uh, in their frenzy, they shot one of their own. And of course, they blamed the killing on move instead of taking the blame themselves. So during this trial, this three year long trial, which was the longest trial in Philadelphia history and uh, quite possibly US history at the time, um, the members of the organization were railroaded. They were discriminated against. They were prejudicially targeted. And the then mayor, mayor Frank Rizzo, who was interested in seeing move people go to prison for the rest of their lives, he continued to instruct the judge to, to, to give up move members as much time in prison as possible. So my mother, who I had once, once I was born in that jail cell, she gave me to my grandmother and my grandmother uh, took me to Move's sister chapter in Richmond, Virginia, called the Seed of Wisdom. And my mother was then sentenced to uh, 100 years in prison. My father was also sentenced to 100 years in prison. While I lived with my aunt and some other members of the Move organization and our sister chapter, the Seed of Wisdom in Richmond, Virginia, we were normal kids that did normal things, at least we thought. Uh, there were about 15 children and we lived communally. There were three caretakers who took care of all of us and many of us had parents that were in prison just like mine. So uh, while we were in that, in that, uh, in that uh, home, uh, the police began to harass us and they treated us with discrimination the same way as they did the move members in Philadelphia. And after three years of living in Richmond, Virginia, we were attacked by the police too. When they attacked our home, they put us in an orphanage, the children they put in an orphanage and they sent the adults to prison. Um, for 11 days, we were in the orphanage where we were beaten by the caretakers, if you will. Our hair, our natural dreadlocks were ripped out of our scalp in their attempt to comb our hair. Um, many, many of the children who were, no, there were 15 of us, the oldest one was 11 years old. And we were, when we resisted the combing of the hair, when we resisted the force feeding, we were attacked and some of us were pushed down the flight of stairs and into a basement where we were forced to huddle together in a corner in the dark basement at the age of myself was three years old and the oldest one of the 15 children was only, as I said, 11. It was very terrifying and traumatizing. After a few days, after 11 days, we were were rescued by the members who got, had got by, by then had gotten out of prison and they came and they took us away from the orphanage. When we came back to Philadelphia, we were um, sought by officials uh, and our, the children and, and the family members that were, that were together in Virginia then relocated Many of them went to a home called Osage Avenue. Uh, and Osage Avenue was a, a move home that we had that we relocated to once our other homes had been destroyed and taken up away from us. So while we were living at this house on Osage Avenue, living our lives the way we did, the Philadelphia Police Department who was in opposition to the way we lived they came to our house and they flew a helicopter over our house and they dropped a bomb on the house. Uh, the bomb ignited a fire and the police commissioner 
instructed the police to let the fire burn. The, the, the fire burned and destroyed 61 homes. It burned over 2000 degrees. And in that burning inferno, the children who were in the orphanage were in that house and they tried to escape and they were shot by police and the adults tried to escape and they were shot by police as well. And when they were shot, their bodies were picked up and thrown back into the fire. And 11 of the members of the organization were killed, including five children. I remember that day, I was six years old and I was watching the smoke in the air as it billowed into the sky. I did not know who was in the house. I was not aware of which children or which adults. When I later found out who it was, as you can imagine, it was devastating and heartbreaking and I still haven't gotten over it since then. The question comes to people's minds, why? Why did the police do this? For what reason? What was the cause, right? The reason is because the MOVE organization has a simple mission. And our mission is to give people information so that they can understand the importance of life. And when you believe in protecting life, that compels you to resist a system that is anti-life. And so <clears throat> in having the belief of protecting life, the types of activities that MOVE did was we would go to the Philadelphia Zoo and protest against the unjust treatment of animals. We would talk about how these tigers were taken from the endless acres of freedom in India and forced into a tiny cage in Philadelphia. We talked about how these elephants were snatched from the endless acres of freedom in Africa and forced into a tiny cage in Philadelphia. We talked about the mistreatment of the animals in the circus. We talked about how these animals were being forced to jump through rings of fire and got people to see just vividly how hard it is, how hard it must be to get a lion or a tiger to jump through a ring of fire. It is hard to catch a tiger let alone get them to jump through a ring of fire. In order for them to get an animal to jump through a ring of fire, they must train these animals with torture and intimidation and starving and separating them from their, from their families and their children. And John Africa, who is the founder of the organization, gave MOVE the understanding. And so we use that understanding to confront injustice in the system in the animals, uh, the treatment of the mistreatment of animals. We also spoke out against the unjust uh, treatment of the earth itself. We talked about how uh, these uh, factories and these power nuclear power plants and they're built and they're constructed and the damage that it does to the environment and how the system, they don't care about what it's doing to the environment as long as they can make money from uh, the, the creation they, they, they created. We also spoke about the unjust treatment of the elderly, how the elders were not getting the medicine they needed. They were not getting the treatment they needed. They were not getting the support, the housing, whatever it was that we saw, saw as an injustice to the elderly move, protested and demonstrated against it. And that, as you can imagine, led us into many, um, many, confrontations with the police. Um, in the same way that you can see Black Lives Matter protesting, and you see Until Freedom protesting, and you see countless other organizations and modern regular everyday citizens protesting against the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and countless others. The same way that we pro that these people are rising up to protest against the killing of Tamir Rice and Sandra Bland and the protesting against the Keystone Pipeline and the same way you see people protesting against Barnum and Bailey Ringling Brothers Circus. 
this is what MOVE was doing in 1972 and 1973. And as a result of our protest and our stand against injustice, we were targeted for it. The same way the protesters are being targeted for it. The same way that Donald Trump is out there talking about uh, uh, protesters are violent. You know, they care more about a, a protest that ends in a riot and a, and a window being broken than they care about George Floyd's neck being broken. So MOVE explained that there is a vast difference there's a vast difference between the a system that that employs the police department that employs the police department to uh, protect property rather than life. We need to fight against this system that will have people more interested in fighting for, we need to fight against the system that has people thinking that property is more important than life. And so we continued to do that and we were un unrelenting. And as a result of our unrelenting stand, the police came to our house and they shot those tear gas grenades and they shot those thousands of rounds of ammunition and they shot those high pressure water cannons you know, people don't really understand the power of a high pressure water cannon because oftentimes what's focused on is the bullets and the power of a bullet. But high pressure water cannons from a fire hose is powerful enough to shoot 10 stories high into the air. They can, they, their power is so great that they can dislodge large stones and move stones out of the foundation of a building. And firefighters are trained to never use those on, on, on buildings that they know people are inside of. But those fire hoses are exactly what was used on us in our home, on men, women, children, and animals. Uh, so what we've done is we've uh, evaluated the fight that we have in front of us and we've escalated our campaign. Uh, rather than take a step back we've taken many steps forward because what we've learned is that we're living in a world where a system exists and their interest is not to protect you. Their interest is to make as much money as they can and they don't care what they have to do to you to get it. So um, as we escalated our campaign, the government escalated their campaign too hence the bombing of our home on Osage Avenue. And although it hurts and it is very painful to go through what we have gone through and the experiences that we've had the, have left us traumatized permanently. It's a ripple effect that affects not just our generation but it also comes out on our, gener on our children too. Because these, this trauma that we have it wasn't made, it, it, was, it was intentionally inflicted on us so that um, if they could, they would break us. They would change our course and they would have us giving up. But what John Africa has taught us is that anything that is worth fighting for is worth fighting for until you achieve your mission. And so we have not achieved our mission so far. Our mission is to protect life and destroy the system. And we will do that by any means necessary. As we continue to fight for life and spread the teaching of John Africa to get people to understand the importance of being connected to nature, um, we've encountered uh, other injustices hurled at us. As I said, my parents were in prison and they were sentenced to a hundred years in prison. Well, we had to change direction because there was, there was uh, we, we had to get our people out of prison. So although we continued to fight for freedom, uh, although we continued to fight to protect life, we still had to protect our people and get them out of prison. Particularly my parents, uh, was a mission that I was on to get my people out of prison. 
I, I did all kinds of things to help get them out. I, 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 uh, ever since I was 13 years old and old enough to understand what a revolutionary is, I've been a revolutionary. And I've been fighting for the release of not just my, my, my mother and father, but for the other members as well and for other revolutionary political prisoners. Um, I took up the, the, the fight to free Mumia Abu-Jamal. I took up the fight to free uh, Russell Maroon Schultz, uh, Jojo Bowen, Fred Muhammad Burton, Leonard Peltier, uh, Mutulu Shakur, uh, and, and, and countless others. Uh, this last five years has been probably the most significant five years in our fight to free political prisoners, because within the last five years, we have seen at least a dozen political prisoners who had been in prison since the 70s and even beyond that. And the quest to free the political prisoners, we have run, come across many obstacles. Uh, probably the biggest obstacle we've come across is people within our own groups trying to um, in, interfere with our groups. And we believe that those people are possibly plants, but they don't really pose as much of a threat as they may think they do because the way that we work and the pace that we're working at is either fast enough where they cannot keep up with us because of the work that we're doing or they move with us and help us do what we're trying to do. Um, in 1978, my parents went to prison. We continued to fight for their release until um, until we actually gained their release on, uh, my mother came home on June 16th, 2018. Four months later, my father came home on October the 23rd. Uh, and then that was followed by um, the other MOVE members who had been arrested in 1978, who were also released to parole. Uh, this fight is not over. Uh, my parents were sentenced to 100 years in prison and uh, they were released after 40 years. So although they're home now, there is uh, 60 years worth of parole that they still have to walk off. Um, my father is 65. He just turned 65 a couple of weeks ago. My mother turned 64 a couple of months ago. I'm sure that we can all do the math. My parents will be on parole for the rest of their lives. Since they've been on parole, uh, one of the things that I've done is I've fought, I've, I've garnered support from many different places. And one of those places that I've gotten a lot of support from is some of the politicians who, who, who ironically are responsible for them being in prison. The injustices in the system are so vast that the same district attorney that put you in prison is the same district attorney who can 40 years later say, you shouldn't have done that much time in the first place. And if I could do it over again, I wouldn't have given you that much time. But that statement that he made still doesn't allow for my parents to be released from parole. So they're restricted. My mother has an ankle bracelet on. That means she can't go but a certain distance away from her home. That also means that she has a curfew. She cannot leave her house past 8 p.m. She has a three county uh, travel restriction, which means that if her mother or her father is dying in a hospital in Philadelphia, being that she's restricted from going to Philadelphia, she cannot go to Philadelphia unless she gets permission. And if that permission is requested on the weekend, well, then she has to wait till the parole officer comes back from their weekend. So there's a lot of stress, a lot of strain, but we persevere. We fight because there are so many others that are suffering much worse than we are. There are animals in the zoo that cannot fight or speak for themselves. There are animals in cages across the country and outside of the country. There are people that are suffering and they don't have a voice or a platform to get a chance to explain to people what suffering is like. When you go to prison, you see what suffering is like. You feel what suffering is like. And the people that are out here on the street who has never experienced that, they can't really conceive of what that is like. It is important for people to tell their stories. The people that have these stories, it's important for us to tell them because otherwise people don't know 
just how inhumane and, and, and subhuman this system really is. Um, uh, I know that we have a time restriction on this conversation, so I won't belabor any points here, but I would like to open it up for question if anyone has any questions uh, that they'd like to ask and, and get a little bit deeper into some of these conversations that we talked about. Um, so I guess I'll send it back over to Lucy. Yeah, so Jalen's gonna be moderating the Q&A session, so I'll pass it on to Okay, Jaylen. thanks Jalen. Hi everyone, I'm Jalen. I'm the um, publicity chair for Black Students United. And I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. Your story is incredibly inspiring and Yes, thank you for all the work you're doing. So um, if anyone has any questions, you can just, you know, raise your hand in the chat or, yeah, actually raise your hand in the chat and that'll make it easier and then I can just like go through. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, Marquand. I don't know if he's talking, oh, yeah. I can't hear him. Uh, Mark, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Oh, you oh, can't unmute? Okay. 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 Hold on, let me see. Okay. Okay, actually, um, you can just type your question in. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Now we can All right. hear you. All right, thank you. I just wanted to, um, you know, it's just an honor having you today to speak to us because a lot of people, including myself, forget that the movement is more than just like mental and physical liberation for Black people. It's for animals. It's for everything that we represent. So I just wanted to say thank you for reminding each and every one of us of what the entire movement stands for. And I wanted to ask you, what can we as college students do to help you, to assist you in your efforts and your organization? Uh, uh, I have a website um, where people can go and, and um, if you want to donate, if you want to get involved with the, some of the projects that we're working on, um, we have a lot of things coming up that we're doing. Um, and so my, the website address is www.mikeafricajr.com. Um, I'm still working on getting my parents off parole uh, and people can help with that. If you can, you know, we're trying to get people to write letters. We're trying to get people to connect us to some of the uh, uh, officials that may have some sway um, and, and if they will be interested in writing letters in support of MOVE, um, my, my parents getting off of parole. Uh, we're, trying to, we're also trying to help get other members of, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the revolutionary movement out of prison. Mumi Abu-Jamal has been in prison since 1981. Their accusation of him killing a cop and there's so much proof and evidence that shows that he did not kill a cop, but he's in prison. He's been in there since, since he was in, in his 20s himself. Um, so yeah, and, and so go to my website and you can find a way to, to get involved. And, 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 um, and if you have any questions or like, you know, sometimes people have suggestions as to how they want to help. Um, so if you have any questions about that, that's possible too. Right now, one of the other things we're doing is we're trying to get a street sign um, for Mumia Abu Jamal Street um, to, 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 to put pressure on uh, the officials in Philadelphia to raise awareness about Mumia's situation. Uh, he's been in prison since 81. He's sick right now and um, he, he doesn't deserve to be in prison. So um, yeah, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the long and short of it. Um, so uh, thank you for answering that. Uh, our next question is, uh, how do you incorporate animal liberation into Black liberation, and should they be? This is from Priya. Please excuse me if I, um, you know, if I mispronounce any of your names, you can just call me out. Uh, well, so the liberation for freedom is really not separate from, from animals. You know, the same way that animals were, are, are uh, arrested and taken away from their families and separated from their families and put in, in on ships and 
put in crates and br brought to, to these different cities across these countries, across these, across these oceans. That's the same way black people were brought in chains from Africa and, and, and to North America and to Brazil. And, you know, um, so the fight for freedom for the animals, we're fight, that, that fight is against the same very system that put black people and Africans in chains. You know, it's the same system that made uh, Irish people indentured service, servants. It's the very same system that, you know, every revolutionary has been fighting. It's just a different category. But the fight to free animals, the fight to, to, to liberate uh, Black people from, the, from the, these captives, it's all the same fight. And it's no different than the fight to free the air from the pollution. All life is connected. And if you, if you don't understand that all life is connected, when you go into these fights, when you join these organizations, you're going to be, you're going to be spinning your wheels. It's very important to understand that all life is connected. The same air that I breathe is the same air that the animals breathe. The same sun that shine on my head shine on their heads. The same, the same uh, uh, knee that was on the neck of George Floyd will kill the animals in the same way. And so uh, we don't see it as a separate movement. We see them as, as you know, I, we, we did in 1990, no, 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 in 2008, the MOVE organization had some of our youth do a, do a, 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 a play about animals. And it was called Animals Are People Too. And so like, you know, if, if you allow us, you know, um, people to, to abuse animals, the same uh, ability, the same insensitivity that it takes to abuse animals, that same insensitivity spills over onto people and, this, and, and vice versa. You know, one is not more important than the other. Life gave all of us and equipped us all with the ability to take care of ourselves and 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 clean ourselves and and use the the food from the trees and from the earth to to feed ourselves and there is this system that comes into place and they want to exploit that they want to exploit the people by forcing us to buy food that nature gives us for free they want to exploit us and make us buy water because the water that we should be drinking from the streams and rivers they pollute it to the point where you don't even recognize it as being water. You know, they, 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 the system has, has, um, has uh, taken control over all of the natural resources that we have been given to us by nature. And they, you know, they tricked us into believing that we should support it. And so, um, no, the, the, the fight for animal liberation is the same fight for, it's the same fight as the fight to uh, get justice for Breonna Taylor. It's the same, it's the same system that that shot those bullets into that house that killed Breonna Taylor. You know, they're all employed by governments and industries, and they're all corrupt, and they're all using the power of the police forces to protect them. So when that people like me and Move and others speak up against it. We're the ones that's called crazy and violent, and even though, you know, they're the ones that's going over to different countries and stealing them from the natives, you know. So, um, you know, it, there is it, only one fight. There's only one movement, the movement to free and protect and liberate life. Thank you. This is Priya. I'm the one that asked the question. Um, I, I think Hi, the, uh, the reason I am I'm trying to figure out how to navigate that space because I am not a black person. I'm a brown person. And with the okay. Black Lives Matter movement, I definitely don't want, you know, there very understandably, there's been a problem with white veganism and the white animal rights movement. Um, and so I don't want this to be a situation where very understandably, I've I've seen black activists get very frustrated and say, you know, here are these people that are rallying for dogs in Yulin or tigers in the zoo, and yet they won't stand with us. 
So I'm trying to figure out how as a non-Black person, I can navigate that space because some of those comparisons, you know, if I were to say something like it's the same chains that, you know, that, that we bring the animals over in, I can definitely see why people would be offended by me saying that. Well, you know, <clears throat> me as a Black person who can speak about the history of my ancestors and how we were brought, they were brought here in chains is, uh, is an example that I can use because I'm a Black person and I can leverage that example because of that, right? If I'm an Irish person, I'm probably going to talk a lot about what was done to Irish people. So maybe for me, it would be colonization in, in India because I'm Indian. There's a lot of colonization in India. Britain has done a job on India, right? There yeah. is so much happening in India that you could draw from and talk about the injustices there because the injustices there are just as the injustices here, right? So um, no, I, I think the people that, you know, there's a definitely people that are leery about um, non-Black people co-opting movements and trying to use that to, uh, to get their positioning and, and more a better place for political or whatever, whatever they got going on. There's definitely a, a problem there. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's, this, it's the typical Elvis Presley stealing the, the music from Chubby Checker and, you know, playing it off, at, passing it off as his own, right? Um, but, you know, people that are sincere and that are genuinely trying to do the work, they find a way to do the work. And that's really what it comes down to. In the past, MOVE was discriminated against because we had dreadlocks and people would come to us and say, well, why you got dreadlocks? You ain't Jamaican. Well, I don't have dreadlocks because I didn't see dreadlocks. I never saw a Jamaican before. I had dreadlocks when I didn't even know what, who Bob Marley was. Um, and the authenticity of who we are, it, it shines through and it breaks down those barriers. And if you're really interested in doing the work, you know, don't let, don't let things like um, whatever type of criticism or whatever that is, deter you from getting the work done. And, 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 I, and I'll, I'll just have to say what John Africa said to move, he said, the power of truth is final. Thank you. you know, so if you're doing the work later for the other people who just talking. Um, the next question is, uh, okay, uh, the next question is from Casey Christian. Um, they said, how can we support this spread? How can we support the spread of the fight for freedom for animals and to communities of color? Uh, be, be vigilant and be active. When you see an injustice, speak about it, expose it, get, the, get, your, get, you know, get connected to news medias and expose it on a bigger level. Uh, tape it with your social media, with your camera, put it on social media and, and, and write letters. You know, writing a letter is a very powerful tool it's a very powerful act that people can use. When you get a letter that says something, whether it be negative or positive, you feel it. And I know that when I get, when I get love mail, it's very inspirational. I feel it. When I get hate mail, because I get hate mail, um, it, you feel it because you, you, know, you got feelings, right? They're, they're, those people that own those corporations like Smithfield and they have people in front of them so that they don't feel that, so that they don't get those. But if you pressure those people that's in front, let them take the heat, they're gonna eventually that, you know, that pressure creates cracks. And it, you know, Barnum and Bailey Ringling Brothers Circus has been around for a long time. And um, MOVE have been protesting against them as long as MOVE has existed. Some of our first protests in the history of the organization has been against the circus. And, um, you know, we, we move is before PETA and move is before a, a lot of other um, uh, animal liberation uh, fronts. But after years of us pounding the pavement and exposing what is happening to these animals and showing the behind the scenes footage of these elephants that are beaten with with electrical rods and prodded with steel spikes and you know separated from their families after years and decades of protesting 
Barnum and Bailey Ringling Brothers decided that they should take the animals out of their programs. You know, so, you know, listen, the circus makes a lot of money. It's a big business. So they don't want to give it up, but who, who, who forget their money. I don't care how much they can find another way to, to make money to feed their families. They don't have to exploit these animals to do it. Right. So, so no, you, you're not allowed to so pressure, pressure, write letters, make phone calls, get your friends involved, get your family involved, you know, get it on social media, get it to some people who, who have influence over other people, you know, and just pressure, 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 make it work. Um, the next question is from Lauren Loney. Uh, they asked, do you think that there is a role for policy advocacy, or for lack of a better phrase, within the system? Is there such thing as a revolutionary policy? <laughs> uh, politics. Is this question about politics? Um, I believe that pressure rules, whether it's, whether it's um, in policy or not, right? The police, there's a policy and a law against killing, but the police kill, listen, the, according to the New York Times, the police kill three black, three unarmed black men, black people. The, the police kill three unarmed black people every day in this country and have since at least 2013 when they started recording the data for this, for this fact. Three unarmed black people every single day. There's a law that says you shouldn't, you can't kill. But the police have, what do they have? They have unions and they have a whole lot of other people backing them and protecting them and waving their Blue Lives Matter flags and you know all of that kind of stuff. And they have this thing called um, qualified immunity, right? But there's a law that says murder is punishable by incarceration, loss of job, li uh, life in prison, death and death by execution, whatever. But the pressure from these unions and these people that support the police makes it where most of these 97% of the time, these police not only don't get fired or don't go to prison, they don't even lose their money. They don't even lose time on the job. So the pressure is really what rules. Policy, I'm not a big fan of policy. Never voted in my life. Um, the next question is from Rebecca Allen. They said, is MOVE currently working to get people out of prison? Absolutely. Uh, we just, since we've gotten our non-political prisoners out, we've been working to get out uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal. Uh, he was a, he's a radio journalist who, who, who would tell the truth about what happened to move. When we would have our skirmishes, he wouldn't just tell the side of the, what happened, well, of the police, he would also tell the side of move. And so because he was supportive of move, he's become a target himself. And so he's been our primary, uh, we've been his primary support system since he's been in prison in 81. And, um, but also we're fighting for Russell Maroon Schultz to be free from prison. After 49 years, Jalil Muntakim has just uh, come home from prison, who we've been supportive of him since we've known about his case in the early 90s. Um, we've been supportive of uh, Herman Bell, and we've been supportive of Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier is a Native American who was accused of killing a, an, an officer, and um, he's been in federal prison since the early 70s. And so we've been fighting for his release. I don't know if he, I, I don't believe he killed the officer. But I'm saying as a Native American, really? He's, he's in prison for killing somebody? These people, this government, this system, this same system, I don't care how long ago it was, this very same system slaughtered his people just about into virtual extinction. So for them to call him a murderer and put him in prison, that's kind of crazy. So yeah, we, we're, we're fighting for political prisoners. Everybody that we know that is a political prisoner, we support and we uh, send resources to their families and um, into their into their support campaigns too. Um, the next question is, what do you attribute your resilience to? Um, 
you know, uh, having the belief of life, nature, we believe that nature is the way and nature is resilient. So I'm just, you know, following behind that example, you know, that basically gives us the resiliency. There is a system that exists as long as we, as long as the system exists and, and pollute, somebody's got to be there to, to fight it, right? You know, when you look at, when you look at the water, look, there's, we're in, Pens I'm in Pennsylvania, and that means Penn's Woods. We're surrounded by water. You can't go three miles anywhere in the city of Philadelphia and probably the state of Pennsylvania itself without coming across a stream or a river or some type of creek, some type of body of water. Every few miles you run into these streams, but the, the country is so polluted that you can't drink any of it. That's tragic. So as long as that is, is the way it is, somebody's got to resist the system that pollutes it. Um, the next question is from uh, Mel Welsh. Uh, they said, how do we make people understand compassion for humans and animals? Because they're exhausted trying to help people see the connection. Yeah, information. You know, like um, people don't really care about animals. Generally, people, they, and they'll hire the exterminator to come in and kill the animal, insects in the house. They'll hire them to come and catch a, a, a groundhog that's been eating up the, the, their garden and they don't care if they kill them or what. They'll hire the 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 um, the, the, uh, the the pest control to come in and and kill. They don't people generally they don't care about animals. They don't think animals are as valuable as important or you know they don't even know that they have feelings. Um, you have to inform them. You have to explain to them that animals do have feelings. Why do you, why do you suppose if you try to hurt them they run or they fight? Why do you suppose that if you go near a cougar? And it's cubs, they will fight. There's a reason for that. You know, they feel, they, they protect their families. Um, and I think it's too, it's, it's a thing of educating people um, and, and untwisting them from what society has done to people. You know, when you're a kid and you go to school and they give you these nursery rhymes and they talk to you about Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs and all of this kind of stuff, they're twisting pal and they're, they're, they're training people to be desensitized to life itself. Um, you know, like um, what's the pur primary purpose of school is what to, to indoctrinate people with their with this government's program. What is it? Uh, the um, uh, what is it? Uh, the primary is, is the is the is the uh, is the reading, writing and arithmetic, but the secondary is socializing and being obedient to your country. That's why they have you hold up the flag and say, I pledge allegiance and hand over the heart. They, they're not even, they're not supposed to do that anymore, but that's their thing. They want to get people to become like patriotic. And what is patriots? Patriots are, they're supposed to be homeland defenders, but they're really not. They're invaders. They go to different countries and invade. And in order to, to kill someone, you have to be desensitized. You have to be, you know, you have to not you have to be, you have to see these people as subhuman. You have to, they have to be demonized, right? And, and in order to do that, they have to train you to believe that they're not important. Black people are just niggas. Spanish people are just, uh, Puerto Ricans are just sticks, right? Um, animals are just dogs. They're just, we're not animals, right? But that type of behavior, that type of thinking has people, um, it gives people it, it it takes away their sensitivity and it gives people the callousness that the government needs them to have to be wicked like that you know when one of the first things that i learned in move growing up is that animals have feelings and technology does not you don't put tech you don't put a car the, the a car that does not have any feelings over a child that does have feelings if you know the system, the way they have things, you know, you, you scratch a car, you, you know, kids will get chastised for that. Their feelings will get hurt for that. The car doesn't have any feelings, can't feel anything, but yet they'll be treated, the children will, the, the, the children will be treated as lesser than important than the car. Um, and we don't, we don't, we don't do things like that and move. We, we, we give the feelings and, and the respect to the people. And, but we have a society that will strive for money and money is corruptive. And one of, one of the things they actually when you go to school is what do you want to be when you grow up? 
Well, if anybody said, I want to be a freedom fighter, teacher would be like, you can't make no money being that. that that's not, <laughs> no, what, what kind of job? What kind of job? Because the jobs support the system. And what is the system? The system is anti-life. You know, so you have to retwist people, you have to untwist people and you have to re-educate them on what is really important. When you see children uh, doing things where they embrace life and they show sensitivity toward animals, you should encourage that. You should make them feel like they should continue to do that. You should make them um, uh, feel so inspired by that encouragement that if someone tries to desensitize them, they will fight to maintain their sensitivity. You know, um, it's all about education. That's why the system takes children when they're young so that they, because when you're young, you're, you're impressionable, right? They, it's like, I give the example of like clay. When you're young, you're like clay. You can be molded and shaped into whatever. The, the, the molder wants to shape you into, but as, as you get older, you get harder and, and set, set in your ways and it's harder to like kind of change you. So the system intentionally takes people when they're young and treat, uh, uh, and tries to indoctrinate them with their program. Well, you have to get those children and give them the truth about the importance of life so that when someone tries to you know, uh, come against them, their, their understanding is cemented into who they are and they will protect life and not hurt life and they will not allow others to hurt life in their presence. You have to educate them. Um, next question is, do you believe that abolishing capitalism is necessary for a true animal liberation? Well, you know, capitalism requires an underclass and an underclass is you know the poor people who suffer right now capitalism is dangerous and capitalism is so effective though because it shows up in our everyday lives people the government will have you thinking that capitalism is you know well everybody for themselves if you work hard enough you can achieve it and all of that kind of stuff yeah well uh, I, I don't subscribe to that type of thinking i believe that um some of the richest people in the world are rich because they stole it, honestly, or was handed to them. And um, the people that are actually working in those nine to five jobs, and we talk about the, the, the healthcare providers that are going into those hospitals and they're grinding, they're working hard and they're coming back, coming out of there and uh, being, having COVID themselves and, 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 they're, and they're being separated from their families and, not just the healthcare providers, but the other people who are supporting the healthcare uh, providers. There are so many people that for the work that they do and the time that they put into the work that they do, they could be gazillionaires, but that's not, it's not that way because um, capitalism is structured um, to, 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 and in such a way where it needs an underclass. And, you know, as long as there is capitalism, you're going to have suffrage. Somebody has to suffer in order for capitalism to exist. And the animals, as long as people see the separation and, the, and accept the, the, um, the, uh, the discrimination against animals, they're, we're, we're always gonna have, have this, this type of thing. If you think that the zoo is a safe place for an animal, guess what? How would you like to trade places with that animal? If you think the circus or any type of place where an animal is captured and placed and what, for what, the study of? Yeah, how would you like to be studied on and examined and, and have an audience when you mate and all these things that seem to be innocent. Oh, I wanna take my kids for an outing. We wanna go to the zoo. You think the zoo is an innocent institution? Absolutely not. It is a very brutal institution for the monkey. It is a very terrifying institution for the cheetah. Think about a cheetah. Cheetahs that roam and run like the wind and they're forced to live in a cage. When people were, when we were dealing with COVID in the beginning, people were mad and hurt that they couldn't leave their own house. Think about a cheetah who is taken from their country and taken away from their families, you know? It, you can't capitalism requires an under underclass and 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 as long as the system of 
uh, of, of um, control exists, animals are going to be on the chopping block. Next question is, be it veganism or the closure of ultimate black liberation, since we're living in the new Jim Crow era, what do you, ha what do you have to say to those who call your ideas and, re and resolutions of today's issues radical? Radical? They better be radical. <laughs> uh, we, we, we make no mistake, we are talking about making a radical change. I mean, you can label it however you want. Do you call the police that kneel on somebody's neck peace officers? And you can label it however you want. Um, you can call it radical, you can call it revolutionary, you can call it, I don't care if you call it violence. It is right to protect life. It is necessary to do what is necessary to protect the life that we need to live. So categorize it however you want. I 100% agree, by the way. <laughs> um, Lucy asked, have you done any work around climate change and what will it take for us to turn the tide before it's too late? Um, is it not too late? Uh, yeah, climate change is another big problem. You know, you know, it's all the same fight. You know, the system that builds a nuclear power plant that they know is going to cause cancer to the 100,000 people that live in that town next door. You know, <laughs> the, the, the fight for the climate would protect those 100,000 people from getting cancer. It would protect the water that flows around and in and, out, and in and out of that town. It will protect the animals that drink from the stream and the animals that live in the stream. This fight that we call a revolution against the system, it's all one fight. And it's all one fight because we're all connected. People can choose their different categories as to which fight they want to partner up with, but it's all the same if it's the same. And um, you can't protect, you cannot, you're not gonna have a successful change fighting for one form and not the other form. You know, it's like people wanna, I remember back in the eighties, there was this thing about save the whales. The whales are being decimated in, in the ocean. And, and now we're talking about plastic and the plastic is, you know, well, let me ask you this, the whale, the, the, the same whale that gets caught up in the nets and, 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 um, and, uh, and, and the krill that eats the plastic that has been, that has broken down and become poison, right? What happens when that whale eats the krill? What happens when, you know, like um, the, the, when the water is polluted and that, and that fish, that salmon that you bought ends up on your dinner table filled with mercury. You know, it, it's all, we're all connected. You know, the, the, the people in Switzerland may believe that their air is more pure than the people in Philadelphia, but the people that built that nuclear power plant in Philadelphia, they go to Switzerland to vacation. And what do you think they think of when they go to Switzerland? It's just a beautiful country that they're never going to leave. They're never going to touch. They're going to leave it alone and let it be pure. This system has no boundaries. And just like at one time, America was pure, right? They're, they have no boundaries. Now there's nuclear power plants. They call LA smog, smog Angeles. You know, um, so, you know, we, we, you know, it's all connected and we, we have to, we have to understand that very important fact. And if you're not, and if you're not working again to stop the, 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 um, the, the, the destruction of, of, of the environment, if you're not working to stop the, the, the imprisonment of animals, if you're not working to, you know, if you're not doing that, doing those things, you know, you're just a part of the system. Thank you. Um, uh, Laura. Do you want to ask your question out loud? 
Uh, I, I have a question. Can I can I ask a question? Yes. Jalen, is your last name really wise? Yes. <laughs> nice, nice. I like that. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Um, All right. So look. Yes. Okay. So uh, let's scroll up here. Hold on a second. <laughs> So I um, wanted to thank you first and say that I really love everything that you're saying here. Um, I'm wondering how you feel about this argument that advocating for veganism as opposed to advocating for forms of anti-speciesism that include traditional indigenous hunting, fishing, et cetera, relationships with wild animals as the most ethical way of rejecting participation in animal oppression is an inherently colonialist mindset. So I wanna make this very clear that I am not talking about criticizing um, indigenous people uh, you know, for subsistence hunting or fishing or even um, criticizing specifically indigenous people you know, as outsiders for anything they do where animals are concerned. But, there's an argument that is made that advocating for veganism in any context <laughs> is inherently colonial because you are basically kind of centering this European conception of what is the best, uh, most liberatory way of interacting with other animals over um, other cultures' attitudes about what might be the most liberatory way to interact with other animals. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I'll ask you this question. Uh, were, did we have endangered species before uh, Columbus? Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> you know, um, veganism, I don't know how old or new it is. Um, and people eating animals like the way the natives ate animals and seals and hunted buffalo and all of that, that's not what put them on the endangered species list. You know, um, that so, so, and, and I, I don't know who coined the phrase or the term vegan. Um, the, 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 the problem that we're facing with the animals and the things that they're going through is you is most of it is because of big business and industry. Um, and so like, and then and then for me too, like um, the the lifestyles that people live and the way they live and how they treat animals and how they treat the environment itself. All of that plays a part in how it, it plays a part in, in, in the planet and, and how the planet does its thing. Um, but, <clears throat> uh, you know, um, people take animals and, and when you put them in cages and hook them up to cold, hook cold pieces of steel up to them and, and pump them for their milk and stealing it from their calves and that's that's a different thing. That is a very different thing from people up in other places. And say, say, take Alaska for an example, and people are hunting seals to eat. And you know, um, you know, life is life is um, life is uh, how do you say um, survival of the fittest? That is really true in nature. Uh, because cheetahs will take down antelope and tigers will take down animals and eat them. And the, the eating of and the consuming of the animals, that's not so much the problem with the system, with, with the way things are. Um, you know, like, and, and then understanding this thing about we're all connected and we're all, we all have feelings. Consider the animal. Consider the the vegetables too. You are what you eat. You know they're alive too. Until you eat them. You know so like, 
you know, we don't, we don't, um, I mean, I don't, I don't advocate for the meaningless slaughter or killing of anything or anyone, not just the animals, but, you know, I don't, I don't advocate the killing of anything, but um, I, I, I don't know how people got into this thing as a veganism and got, it's like, I, I don't know. I think, I think at times people weaponize the word, you know, and, and they try to like, um, you know, they try to weaponize it and have people believing that that's the way that you should be. And in fact, that may not be the way for you should be for some people. I know, I know some vegans take vitamin D or vitamin B supplements because there's something missing in their diet and it, that, that is found in a non-vegan product. Um, for some people, there are certain things that you may need that may be found somewhere else. Because you got to know, there are some serious deficiencies in people because of the system and their pollution. Some of the treatments that people get um, for uh, ailments that they have come from animals. You know, one of the best um, uh, 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 remedies for, for a snake bite is to be injected with snake venom. You know, like there are certain treatments that come from animals. And so, I, you know, I don't really try to dictate to people what they should or should not do. Uh, other than, you know, treat people with respect and, and treat animals with respect and, um, and, and, and don't mean it meaninglessly kill and don't um, waste, you know, that's where I'm coming from with it. You know, that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from with it. And dictating, uh, uh, um, I think we have a lot bigger problems uh, to worry about than trying to like examine the cultural experiences or, or um, you know, that the, 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 that the natives were going through. We got a Keystone pipeline to get rid of, right? So like, you know, I, I don't really get too deep into how people should live in that way. And for the next two, we're going to have uh, Chloe Cabrera and then Donna, Donna, Donna Jean. Oh, you're on mute, Chloe. I'm trying to see people as they talk. Okay, there we go. Hello. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing your story. I just, I wanted to ask, um, vegans are often criticized for their support of individual action as a force of change. Um, and I wanted to ask how important do you think personal accountability is for encouraging change on a larger scale? And then like on that note, to what degree does capitalism absolve individuals of responsibility if it does ever? absolve people of individual responsibility? I can't hear you, Chloe. Sorry, I muted myself again. Uh, I guess what I'm referring to is uh, this thing that I hear a lot um, as a vegan activist saying, you know, uh, we, you know, under capitalism, most of the pollution being produced in the world is by these like same three corporations. What is like my impact going to do? Um, I am a person living under the constraints of capitalism. You know, it's not just so easy for me to go and get um, whole foods that are plant-based from a grocery store. I live in a food desert. I have, you know, all of these practical constraints to um, really putting a vegan perspective into practice. And so I think a lot of people will kind of write off veganism as like a strategy in general, be like, that's, you know, that's that's very hard. And like, it's, it's a waste of energy anyway, because it's like three really, really, really rich people who are causing most of the problems anyway. What I would accomplish is a drop in a bucket. So that, that's kind of what I'm referring to when I ask like, does capitalism absolve anyone of responsibility, um, specifically yeah. people who are under a lot of practical constraints um, with respect to practicing their veganism. Yeah, you know, what I say to those people is, um, 
You're dropping the bucket. We need that drop. Because <laughs> those drops add up. You know, the ocean is made up of a whole lot of drops, but it's very powerful when they come together. You know, no, cap. Uh, you got to listen. Either you're going to do it or you're not. If you don't want to do it, just be man or woman or whatever enough to say, I'm a coward and I don't want to help you do your thing that I know is right and we need it, but I ain't going to help you. Um, that's where I'm coming from with it. And that's just my personal opinion. That's not necessarily principle, maybe. But look, everybody need, you know, we need help in this. And um, the same fit, the, ain't, the same air that we fighting for is you got to breathe too. And we fighting for the water that you got to drink. And we fighting for the animals that got to drink too. So no, no, it don't. You, you in a food desert. I mean, there's a way if you want to find a way. I know a lot of people that's in food deserts that's, that are still active. You know, um, I know a lot of meat eaters that are active. You know what I'm saying? They eat bacon from Smithfield every day. And that's, that's their, you know, thing. But, you know, when you go to a rally, when you, when you, when you need a letter written, you got you to gotta know that everybody ain't going to think, think the same way you think. And they're not going to get involved with it no matter how passionate you feel about it, no matter how right you know it is. They're not going to do it. Find a way that, that way they can support. You know, um, when Move Source started wearing our hair in dreadlocks, it wasn't, you know, we weren't trying to, we weren't trying to make a fashion statement. We were just doing what we thought was, you know, close to nature and let, you know, not combing our hair. John Africa, the reason we didn't comb our hair is because John Africa said, he said, if you comb, he said, if you breathe the smoke from the smokestack that make in, from the industry that make combs, I'll comb my hair. He said, oh, he never combed his hair. You know, so like, um, but everybody ain't that, ain't that committed to that. But a lot of people were willing to do other things. And, you know, you just find a place where, how they say, meet them where they are. Get them where you fit in. And never discourage anybody from working. You know, um, but no, nah, capitalism don't, don't make them see it right. No, nah, they, <laughs> capitalism is a problem. Capitalism is effective though, because it's, it shows up in your everyday life. You see it on the television. You see it in, you know, you're learning it in schools. You're, you're involved in capitalistic activities and ideas every single day. Get more, get more. But um, for the people that's going to work and putting their little money in their savings accounts and trying to, you know, get ahead and all of that kind of stuff, it's a struggle. The system has really put us in a tight situation where oftentimes the revolutionary activities that we do would make us uncomfortable because we wouldn't make as much money or we might lose our jobs or we may be attacked or whatever. But um, we all got to die from something. Thank you so much. Next question is from Donna. Hello, Donna. Hello Mike. Um, I know Hi, you Donna. can um, send money to political vegan prisoners through their- Say that again. Um, but I was wondering if you're aware of any movement to actually transition prisons, prisons as a whole to stop them serving animals and exploiting animals. Well, actually the organization that I'm involved in now is talking about abolishing prisons altogether. So- Yes, uh, <laughs> yes I know, the, the, <laughs> that's first. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's on the table for like, you know, um, no, um, Prisoners have such a small variety of food products, period. You know, when, when you go to the prison, if you're ever unfortunate enough to be behind the scenes and get a chance to see the foods that come into the prisons, sometimes the boxes have labels on them that says not for human consumption. Oh. So, you know, getting a sandwich that has some meat on it, that may be more healthy for them than the vegan thing that said not for human consumption. What is that stuff, right? So um, now we're more about the prison itself and, and um, finding a way to actually rehabilitate people instead of um, 
trying to make them more comfortable in captivity. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Aaron. They said, can you talk about the life versus technology dichotomy? Yes, it's, uh, it's a dichotomy, all right. Um, you know, you know, we are in the system and surrounded by it and trying to live natural. We've done that. We've been there and no clothes. I'm talking about like the animals live and it ain't easy. It ain't even possible because the system, they interrupt and then you don't get anything done. So it's kind of a seesaw, you know, you got to do certain things to get certain things and you know, you know, right now we're on a on an iPhone. I'm on an iPhone, right? Um, the mission is to get the information out. And that mission is important so that people can um, take steps to, 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 to our ultimate goal. Uh, it's important to encourage people to understand that life is more important. Life is not only more important, it's not the only, it's not as important as it's the only priority. Um, but technology, <clears throat> people love it. People have been trained with it. They've been up, brought up on it. So they love it. Um, but you know, it's kind of like veganism. When you first start it, a lot of times you got to like work your way into it. You know, people might give up meat. They may give up pork first and then they'll give up beef. And then they'll be on the water. Then they give up chicken and fish. And then before you know it, they're giving up eggs and milk. And cheese might be the hardest thing they have to give up. But if they're dedicated, eventually they work that off of their list too. And it's the same thing with technology. You know, uh, sometimes you have five telev a, a television in every room. Put one less. Put one less than that. And work your way get the children to watch one television together and pick a show and eventually get them to go outside more and be outside and try to work that out of it. I mean, technology is in our everyday lives, but it's important to um, not put priority on it, put priority on life itself. I think I got time for one more question, guys. Yes, so yeah. It's uh, it's about to end in 10 minutes. So one question is, um, how can we reach out to you to send you very like well-deserved love mail? <laughs> oh, but, thank you. I love love mail. Let me tell you, because I get hate mail and you, you, your family and you da 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 I ain't even going to tell you what people say. But love mail, oh, I love love mail feels so good to get. It's like a nice warm hug in a letter. Um, so yeah, um, go to my website, Mike Africa, www.mikeafricajr. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. Uh, www.mikeafricajr.com. And you know, you can contact us through there. Um, you know, the ways to support, uh, we, we love it, you know, cause it's, cause it's needed. It's, it really is. You know, my dad says, um, after, after all those years of prison, my, I, somebody asked my dad, they said, they said, um, they said, you know, you spent 40 years in prison. You saw people murdered in prison. Your family was killed. Your wife had her baby, your, your, your baby in jail. Uh, what they, they said, do you think that you need therapy? And dad said, the love that people give me and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the, um, the vibration from the people when he goes and does a speaking engagement he said, that is therapy, you know, to feel that love and not be hit with a, with, by an armed guard, you know, to not be shoved into a prison cell, you know, to, to get support and hugs and congratulations from people that are welcoming to him. Uh, that is therapy for him. And it's the same thing with me too. So keep the hugs coming. Well, thank you everyone for asking so many questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but oh, we get we didn't you know. get to all of them. There's more. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of questions. Oh um, man, I, it, listen, 
for excuse me, Jalen, um, for the people that have more questions, on my website is ways to um, contact us, and um, we'll 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 answer as many questions as we can. And sometimes it takes us a while because we do have a lot of um, mail coming in, but um, yeah, we 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 really we really try to respond to everyone. Thank you, Julie. Um, Yes, thank you, everyone. Uh, yes. yes, thank you to the organizers, Lucy and Jalen for moderating. It's been uh, it's been a very fun time. I, I love doing these things. I can't always because I got all kinds of stuff coming up. Oh, um, HBO is premiering one of our one of uh, these films about my uh, quest to free my parents. That HBO is doing this thing uh, on December eighth. It comes out, but I think you can catch it if you just go look up uh, 40 Years a Prisoner." You'll find it. It's it, it's on film festivals right now. Michael B. Jordan put it on his film festival. He liked it. Make sure to check that thank out. You, at Nancy. And thank you so much, Mike. And thank you everyone that made it out here today. I hope you all have a wonderful night. And like I mentioned, look out for future events because we're gonna have a few more conversations like these.